Well, good afternoon. Welcome to St. Peter's Episcopal Church. I know some people are here for the first time. Some of you are old regulars. And we are also welcoming all who are joining us through our web stream. I'm the Reverend Ann Thatcher, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the rector here of St. Peter's Church. And I also have the honor and privilege of introducing Dr. Miroslav Wolf for our annual Spong Lecture Series. I was fortunate to study systematic theology with Dr. Wolf while I was a student at Yale Divinity School. And one of the most takeaways, important takeaways for me, was after I left, they established the Center for Faith and Culture at Yale and the podcast called For the Life of the World. And I've been saying to this congregation recently that theology does not have to be left to the halls of academia but rather it's about wrestling with it and what it means for our lives. And Dr. Wolf's work, both at Yale and his writings and the podcasts, are all about the application of theology to who we are today. He has a tremendous scholarship, books from an exclusion and embrace to free of charge, flourishing, all a, a Christian response, and many others. He's also Episcopalian and has participated in ecumenical talks in parts of the world. He's dedicated to theology as a way of life, and what an extraordinary opportunity we have today to welcome him to St. Peter's for our lecture series. Welcome, Dr. Volk. It's a long way to get up here. <laughs> Reverend Ann, <laughs> Reverend Thatcher, thank you so much for uh, these words of introduction uh, and also for the invitation to deliver this uh, Spong, uh, Spong lecture. Uh, Bishop Spong was a trailblazer. I don't need to talk to you about uh, that. Um, uh, and a controversial, controversial figure. Um, kind of the legacy that he left of engagement with contemporary realities is, I think, something that needs to be cherished and something that needs to be uh, inhabited and, uh, and furthered. Uh, he and I might disagree on some issues, but there are some very profound and important issues on which we agree. I think we would agree that one of the most profound questions that we as human beings can ask is really a question about which Christian faith is in many ways all about, notwithstanding all the ways in which we might reinterpret Christian faith given how our science progresses. And that's the question of what is the shape of our lives? What kinds of lives are worthy of our humanity, and what kind of a world is worthy of our humanity? As it turns out, science can tell us a lot about how to achieve the goals that we set for ourselves. But it can tell us very little, in fact, about what it is that we should want. It can help us design technologies and understand the world, but it cannot tell me what I ought to desire, who I as a human being should be, or as I have put it, what's worthy of my humanity. And I think on this point, on this, I think, crucial point, we agree. And it's about this point that I want to talk to you Today and tomorrow, my lecture today and the sermon tomorrow comprise a unity. And they're organized around the metaphor of home. The gospel reading for tomorrow is the story of the prodigal son. And of course, the story of the prodigal son is a, stor a story of leaving home, uh, discovering um, that uh, in the far country, things aren't as beautiful as they seem, and then return back. 
Now, I'm going to uh, make uh, my, my two lectures, no, my lecture and the sermon, my two talks, will have three parts. Uh, first part is going to be a bit about home. What does this metaphor home mean? Um, second part will be about far country. And most of my talk today will be this bit about what the home is and what the far country is. And then tomorrow I will talk about the return. So this is the, this is the sketch. And I will start my lecture with a very basic question, really basic question. Here's the question. Why did God create the world? This is one of the most important big questions, questions we almost never ask. Maybe there are good reasons why we don't bother with this question. For one, it is just dauntingly big. It even seems impossible to answer. How would we know what was in God's mind when God decided to create the world? And didn't prophet Isaiah say that God's ways are as far from our ways, God's thought as far from our thoughts as the heaven is from the earth? Second, even if we could answer this question, the question might not be that important. After all, why God created the world seems far removed from our ordinary lives. It's like that famous philosophical question. Why is there something rather than nothing? That's interesting for philosophical and theological geeks, but insignificant to the rest of us. Or at least it seems insignificant. Better devote our energies to more consequential and more urgent tasks like improving the lives of 2.6 billion people who live on $2 a day. Now those 2.6 billion poor, each one of them a child of God, they're extremely important. And I will return to them in a moment and to how our big question matters also for them. But first, let me ask you, a very personal question. Why do you exist? I'm not asking how you came to be born. We all know the basics of biology involved. I'm asking for the purpose of your life. Christians and theists more broadly have always believed that we do not choose the purpose of our lives as it suits us, the way I might choose an outfit for an evening or for a party, or the way I was choosing what kind, choosing what kind of pocket square to wear for this occasion. The purpose, our purpose, is woven into the fabric of our very being as God's creatures. And that takes us straight back to our very big question. Why did God create the world? Each one of us included. You and I are part of the web of creation. And our human purpose, like our flourishing itself, is wrapped up with the purpose of the whole creation. To ask why God created the world is at the same time to ask how to live rightly in our planetary home and what is our vocation in it. So why did God create the world? Now two books of the Bible, Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and the Gospel of John start with the words, in the beginning and then get, go on to say, state that God created all things. Neither of, neither of them says right away why. But if you continue to trace the big story they tell, and it starts with creation, a clear and unified answer emerges. 
And here's the answer. God created the world to be the joint home of God and humans. Here's how this story goes in each of these versions. Let's take first Genesis. The arc of the story that starts at the beginning of Genesis closes at the end of Exodus. If you haven't read together Genesis and Exodus, take, take, it, take it as a task for yourself for the next week. Read these two uh, together. God creates and declares creation good. Humans sully its goodness. God calls Abraham. God delivers the children of Israel from slavery in, in Egypt. And all of this to fulfill one purpose, one promise. I will dwell among the Israelites and I will be their God. When the glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle at the very end of Exodus, God has come to dwell with the people and to lead them to the promised land. God's dwelling in Israel, in the people and in the land, is the capstone of creation. So first chapter of Genesis, last chapter of Exodus, form a unit. In John's Gospel, the very last words of Jesus, Jesus says before he is arrested, condemned, and crucified, explain why he came to the world. Why, oh, I'm sorry, explain why the world came to be. God created all things. God comes to dwell in Israel, takes on human flesh in Jesus Christ. God reveals God's character. God bears human sin and conquers evil. All of this with a single overarching purpose. So that the love with which the Father loved the Son before the foundation of the world may be in Jesus' disciples. In fact, so that the Father and the Son, two persons of the Trinity themselves, may come to the disciples, and here's that word again, make their home in them. Put simply, God created the world to dwell in it. Once you have these big stories clear in front of your eyes, it becomes, becomes obvious that the very first scenes of the Bible in Genesis and very last scenes of the Bible in the book of Revelation tell the same, make the same point. Garden of Eden and New Jerusalem are also about God's home. Why did God create the first humans and place them in the Garden of Eden? To help the garden flourish as their home. And why did God come to walk in the garden at the time of the cool of the day? God knew when to come, right? <laughs> when the day was cool and you have a, it's a, it's a very human story, story of God. And you might think sometimes they were naive and then came up with this very naive notions uh, of God. But, but actually they were very much aware that the entire creation cannot contain God. And yet, of course they tell a story how God comes, walks, and you can... If you read it, you can hear the rustling of God's steps in the garden. I love that part. God walks and you can hear leaves breaking under God's steps and God comes in the middle, in the cool of the day. Why did God come? Well, because this garden is not just Adam and Eve's home. It's God's home as well. The Bible closes by making the same point. At the very end of Revelation, John of Patmos sees the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven to the renewed earth to make sure that John doesn't miss the meaning of what is right there before his eyes. There's a loud voice from the thr throne, God's voice, which explains, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, and they will be his peoples. God and the peoples of the earth now have a home together. The reason why God created the world is not obscure at all. God explained it more than once. God the creator is a homemaker 
God. Now we can return to these 2.6 billion impoverished people, many of whom are either homeless or live under conditions that are hardly worthy of the name home. Starting with poverty, I will briefly discuss then four major forces that oppose God's purpose with creation, obstacles in God's homemaking project, ways in which we are far away from home, even though we are in what is God's home. Sometimes we are furthest from home when we are at home itself. Let's think then first about the economics of home, specifically about the distribution of wealth, though I could equally as well explore the distribution of opportunities and not just of wealth. How would you feel about a home in which a child and their mother live on $2 a day, one sibling lives on $20 a day, another, even more privileged, sibling $200 a day, and the father has $2,000 a day for his sole disposal. Now, if you're doing the math, you'll immediately see that I left out of my images here the super-rich. They matter less than we generally think, and often our appeal to them serves to relieve the bad conscience of people who are just like you and me, kind of global middle and upper classes. Now imagine the meal of this family. At one end of the dining room table, two family members in threadbare clothes with half full bowls of plain rice and a pitcher of polluted water while at the other end of the same table, father and a sibling dressed in latest fashion enjoy culinary masterpieces and exquisite wine. If that happened in your neighbor's home, my guess is you would be scandalized. As the story Jesus told about the rich men and Lazarus in the Gospel of Luke attests, God would be scandalized as well. And yet, you and I live in just such a home, our single planetary home. Now, even if you are at a loss about what exactly to do about this issue as I am, discomfort with how, we, how far we are from God's purpose is part of the point of my example here. Now, from economics, we go straight to politics. The two are inextricably linked. The politics of home closely tracks its economics. The malnourished and shabbily clad group at the, end of, end, at the one end of the table, they will be casting longing looks toward the other side of the table. How could you blame them for wanting to partake of that sumptuous meal? As to the feasters, if they even dignify the other side of the table with their attention at all, it will be with a sense of their own superiority to ensure and to ensure that the poor are kept at the distance. For the proximity of the tribe of Lazarus could endanger their superior standing and the benefits of their privilege. Eventually, some kind of a wall would go up and security apparatus would be put in place. What was a single home would be divided. Lazarus, perhaps with bitterness and anger simmering in his soul, would end up in some makeshift abode. The rich man would build himself his fortress, a testimony not only to his wealth and power, but to his fear as well. But both would be homeless, though each in a different way, 
one locked up in the gilded prison of his luxury and false superiority, the other mired in a life of languishing and precarity. Fundamentally, the two are brothers. In the story that Jesus tells, they're Abraham's children. God created each. God meant for both to live in a single home. From the dawn of history until the present day, wealth and power have been thwarting God's homemaking purposes. Now, more specifically, our inordinate love for wealth and misuse of power have done so. For we need both wealth and power to have home. Indeed, without wealth and power, we could not exist as human beings and have any home at all. And yet, when wealth and power become distorted, when they acquire the monstrous feature of what Bible calls mammon and Leviathan, they undermine our flourishing and undo our sense of common belonging. So, two ways how we are far away from, from home. Mammon and Leviathan. Mammon and Leviathan are ancient foes of God's home. It is important, though, to be on the lookout for specifically modern foes of God's home as well. I will note only two. Being modern, they also have modern-sounding names. Escalation and reification. I'll explain. The fancy names notwithstanding, we experience these unhoming forces every day. And they too are monsters like Mammon and Leviathan. So let's start first with escalation. To survive in modern societies, you have to live the way you ride a bicycle, moving forward. The moment you stop, you fall. And the thing is, it's not enough just to move at whatever pace suits you or you are able. You are in a race, whether you want it or not, and you have to keep moving faster and faster. That's escalation. Call this monster Cursus, the racer. He is at work in two key domains that concern our time and then concern the space of our lives as well. So let's take first time. The pace of life is accelerated. We never have enough time. Describing this phenomenon, sociologist, German sociologist Hartmut Rosa writes, amid monetary and technological affluence, citizens of modern societies are close to temporal insolvency. For short, we are always running behind, which is to say that we are always running. Whether you are on the poor or rich end of the table, we mostly rush through our meals worrying about what we have left undone, catching up on the news, multitasking. And meals, like the rest of our lives, are just the speedy steps of a hamster whose wheel is spinning faster and faster. And the hamster wheel can never be a home for us humans. So that's about time. Second, it's about scope and space. Scope of our activities is expanding. When I was a student, we used to joke about the president of our college. And the question was, what's the difference between God and Dr. Kuzmich? And the response was, God is everywhere, and Dr. Kuzmich is everywhere except here. <laughs> now, students today could not tell that joke without becoming themselves the butt of the joke. With a smartphone in their hand, they too are everywhere except here. Always somewhere else means 
never really at home. Home needs time and home needs presence. But the logic of escalation makes both hard to come by. The story that it keeps telling us, this monster curses in both of these dimensions, expansion of space uh, and uh, increase in, in pace. In both of these domains, the story it keeps telling us is this, where I am and what I do. Who I am and what I have are never good enough. The consequence, with curses running our lives, there is no time when I feel at home and no place where I am truly at home. So that's about escalation. Now the second modern monster, reification. I will call that monster Medusa, one who turns things into stones. Another term for reification is thingification. Those of you who are studying maybe colonial studies will know that that's the term that's generally being used. used. <clears throat> Everything that surrounds us, all God's creatures, turn into cold, lifeless things. Now, this dynamic is all around us. It is there, for instance, in sciences, which tend to treat all entities as things, as part of the network of mathematically calculable causal relations. Modern technology does the same. To a person with a hammer, all things look like a nail. The saying goes to a person with a tool, all things become manipulable objects. Modern medicine is a case in point. It's, it is very successful, but that's in part because it tends to treat human bodies as machines to be fixed. For a personal example of Medusa's reifying work, return with me to Lazarus at the one end of the table and the rich man at the other. Lazarus sits on a scratched up wobbly plastic chair fished out of a dumpster. It's a near replaceable thing for him. It serves its purpose though rather badly, it is not an old friend with which he resonates so that when he sits on it, he feels in a sense at one with it, at home in his chair, like a grand grandfather's chair, right? Uh, the, this is my chair, right? When I sit in the table, that, now this chair is mine. I've sat all the time with it. I have a particular relationship with my chair, right? It's very hard to have that relationship if you fished it out of the dumpster of a certain type of chair. Rich man sits in his armchair as a king on his throne, but for him too the chair is not an old friend. It's a thing whose chief purpose is to underscore his superiority. If anyone at the table had a better chair, he'd discard this one and go buy himself an even better one. When people and things matter to us as means, but not in their own right. We really do not have a home. So we have our answer to our very big question. Why did God create the world? God created the world so that it might be God's home and ours. And we have four home-destroying monsters. Mammon, Leviathan, Cursus the racer, and Medusa the one who think, turns everything into stone. The conflict between God's homemaking and these monsters is the site of our Christian and human calling. Jesus was God in the world on the mission of planetary homemaking. He gave his disciples his spirit so that they would continue his mission and do their part in helping make the world into God's home. Why? Because we humans 
can be what we are created to be only together. And when each of us becomes a nodal point of genuinely home-like relations. Let's think about home. It's not a collection of individuals. It manifestly isn't. And any simple collection of individuals, individual persons or individual arbitrary things, isn't a home. And the claim is that we flourish when we don't relate to each other and to things as mere individuals. We relate as nodal points of a relationship. That's what home is. Of course, we can never make the world into God's home. We can, we can never make it fully into our own home either. But we can live in more home-like ways. We can take time to build resonant relationships with people and places. And we can work to heal the fractures caused by those unhoming forces. We can struggle against homelessness in our cities or work for more participatory politics and equitable economics. We can open ourselves to God's transformative presence. We ourselves can be homes of God and homemakers with God while we hope for the coming of God's home. Now that's why you need to know why God created the world. Tomorrow, building on the Gospel of Luke, Luke 15, I will explore a bit what it takes to mend a home that has been broken. Thank you. I think I'm supposed to stay here somewhere. I'm supposed to stay here, right? Not, not go, not go, not, no, I'm going to come down here and not stay up there, right? <laughs> so we wanted to provide an opportunity for you to engage with Dr. Wolf with questions you have based on what you've just listened to or if you're familiar with his work. And um, so this is now a, an invitation to a time of conversation. And if you do have something you'd like to ask or, or comment on, I'm going to invite you to come do so here from the lectern so that we can all hear you. So um, the floor is open. Come on up. Anyone want to lead us off? Yeah, Carolyn, come on up. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I do have a, a question. I don't know if it's theological, philosophical, or what. But in my Christian religion, I get very confused at the use of the word hope. Because I see hope as the way we use the word hope, as a state of despair where we have absolutely no control over our lives and that's why we say oh I hope for this and I hope for that and you just said at the end hope for the coming of God's home and in my mind I want to use the word certain certain uh, something certain uh, assuredly because of my belief in the resurrection Maybe you can straighten me out. <laughs> or maybe, I, have I been clear? You, you, you have been very clear in, what, in, in your kind of sketching of the problematics of the word hope. Yes. Yes. Um, Should I leave? My turn? Yes. <laughs> um, So 
So, so let, me, let me try to, to, to argue for exact opposite of what you're asking me to, where you're pushing me to go. Um, so certainty about the, about the future. Um, in an important sense, and you, you mentioned resurrection. Um, expectation of resurrection, right? A promise of resurrection, right? And, and so forth. Something that's very, very, uh, very certain in that sense. Well, it's, it's in the Nicene Creed, and that's what we believe. So I just, in my Christian faith, I just have a very strong feeling of certainty about uh, God's existence in our lives in terms of home, rather than saying, oh, I hope Jesus would help me here. Or, I hope God can help me get out of this situation. Or I hope someone will not die. I hope it will not snow. Or hope, 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 hope. It's just such a, for me, a flimsy word. And I can't get out of that. Yet I have this cert certainty of God's love and God's and Jesus' resurrection. Yeah, I, I, uh, my, my sense is the way I read the, 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 the Christian talk about home, uh, hope is not that it's a matter of uh, lack of certainty. Um, it, it's a matter, and, and, and that's where I was, I was going to go. Remember how in Romans 8, um, for we hope in what we do not see. If we see something, then we don't hope. Then it's, we're certain, right? <laughs> it's there, we can touch it. Uh, but we hope in what we do not see, right? Now... That's faith. So that's, a, that, and that's why, you know, one definition of hope is faith on the tiptoes, right? So faith stretching itself into something to grasp it, and whatever I'm stretching myself into, isn't there yet, right? I am reaching out to get it, right? In some way. That's what, what hope is. But, so, so, so that hope will be fulfilled. That resurrection is going to come. Uh, that, seems, that seems certain, right? But what is, the, what is it that we will receive? Seems, Luther puts it this way, uh, we do not see what we hope for, right? And he says, it's in the darkness. We don't know exactly what's going to be. We, we, we know that promises are going to be true. But if I think of myself as knowing how, what the shape of the hope for is, I am, uh, I'm setting myself up for quite a few disappointments. And I think the beauty of the dynamics of hope is that it lets us live into the future without nailing the future to, its, uh, to, to the shape in which we want it to, to come to us. So that hope ends up having this sense of openness to the future that comes to us and ends up looking slightly and maybe radically different than we had imagined, but nonetheless, the good. And uh, it, uh, it, if I was a psychologist, I might say, this is a way to manage our expectations, <laughs> all right? And managing expectation is half of the life's wisdom in many ways, all right? Uh, but, but if one thinks of it as, I don't know the course of my life. My life is not open to me. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow to me. Uh, that's then guided by hope that the good thing in which I believe will be the case, but its shape is open. In other words, what you're saying is hope gives us the impetus for our faith and to keep trying and thinking about things and mulling things over and never being satisfied with what our, the limitations of our mind and what our mind Produces. And it gives us flexibility to be always open to the shape of fulfillment that might be different than what we have imagined and that 
when we encounter something that differ, that's different than what we imagine, we are not always disappointed because yeah. we have not gotten what we wanted. <laughs> because one, one of the, um, I mean, we want to control our future, right? Exactly. And yet we can't control right. the future. And in this impossibility of control, but nonetheless, ability then joyfully to go into the future, that's where the hope, uh, I think, in the Christian sense, resides. Uh, ability like, um, like Abraham and Sarah, who didn't have a child, the promise was given, they attempt in many different ways to fulfill that somehow, for have that promise somehow fulfilled, and it is not coming in the way in which they have expected, and then finally it arrives that having hope rather than certain certainty about exact kinds of outcomes we, we want allow us to be on a journey with God rather than simply control completely fully our environment which we as fallible, fragile people living in environments which um, are made of fallible and fragile uh, people can never actually do. So I'm a great believer in, in hope. <laughs> I'll have to work on that one. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I'm wondering if you can reflect on these four monsters in light of how we have been engaging with our understanding of home through a pandemic. Because for a lot of people with COVID, our lives were completely transformed in ways we did not anticipate. And how we defined home was upended in all sorts of ways, whether that was shifts in economics or even, you know, our, our home also became our, our workspace and our, our lives were collapsed into smaller places. Um, so can you extrapolate on that a little bit? Yeah, the, my, my reflection about home uh, was taking place precisely in the, <clears throat> in the context of, of pandemic. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a very interesting experience. Um, of course, it's a little bit different for, for introverts like, like I am, right? And people who work, uh, whether you're a writer or, or, or whatever. I mean, being alone, you know, it's God sent, you know, and if there are no distractions, wow, that's fantastic, right? Uh, but on the other hand, uh, folks who have, are, that are of a little bit different type, they may feel it, it's just uh, completely narrow down the, the sphere of, of interactions. But what I, what I had the sense or, or need is to kind of reaffirm the, the boundaries of home. I, I felt almost pandemic, uh, pandemic was uh, invading the home and everything. Pandemic has become everything, kind of leveling home and, and non-home. And even when you were at home, you were kind of in this, um, in this strange, uh, strange space. Uh, and of course, everything is transfigured. So what I did, uh, I lived at that time in a <clears throat> in one of the uh, New England homes with with a uh, with a uh, stone loose stone uh, fence uh, around, and I have rebuilt about 200 yards of uh, loose stone fence uh, in a sense to establish somehow both the kind of boundaries, uh, protective I suspect boundaries, and at the same time. To, to be, and it's, it was outside, right? And at the same time, to, to, be, to be out, to affirm that this home that I have is not simply within those walls enclosed, but is connected with, uh, with, with open uh, skies, with the nature that, that, that surrounds. And I felt that those were the challenges. How does one, how does one, how does that not turn into some kind of a little fortress, a home that is self-enclosed completely? Or how does one manage boundaries in such a way that what you don't want coming in doesn't come in, but, so that, but on the other hand, that you're not closed, completely uh, shuttered. Um, because home is, we, we build our homes so that they have doors, so that they have windows, 
uh, so we can open them, so, we can, uh, so, so there can be traffic going in and out of, of home. And that is essential to home. So last point, I guess, I want to make is if one imagines one's home as simply uh, that enclosure that is there, obviously with the porous and so forth, I, I don't think that's quite, quite correct. Home is always situated in the larger environment. You take the home out of that larger environment, it isn't what it is anymore. It becomes something very, very different. And so connection between home and environment is really important. And that's why I think that having some imagining, um, say, a town as home of homes, imagining the world as home of homes, is really an interesting thought, because then you situate each of those homes into in a larger network that also have the same kinds of features, and yet they operate uh, in a larger space uh, and uh, often different ones in a different ways. So what I hear you saying is, is when people talk about things like their family compound, <laughs> interesting how we sometimes use military language to describe yes, a home. Yes. You, know, you said fortress, you know, the compound, the enclave, yeah. um, and certainly with COVID that has become even more so because we were in family pods or community pods where we stopped crossing each other's thresh thresholds and really did create more of a, a fortress type of existence. Um, so what I, what I hear you reflecting on is in, in that broader understanding of home is that while we can attempt to define our home to be our family compound, it's, an act, it's a fallacy to think that it, it is really a standalone entity, but it really is um, fully connected to our social location in every aspect. And sociological studies all confirm that, that obviously people... Uh, People don't work doesn't doesn't stay outside and non-home relations don't stay fully outside. They're brought into uh, into the home, uh, and it's not as if you can create. Uh, sometimes we have some, almost like a ideology of home as our little castle. There we are secure. There is a the world is is intact, right? And everything that we know actually suggests that to, to a degree that that is certainly the case. It's, a, it's our nest, right? It's a protective uh, area for us. But if we think that we can simply insulate it from the outside world, I think that's a major mistake. And it's a major mistake about the nature of this internal space, but it's also a major mistake about the sphere of our responsibility and to what we belong. We belong to that home, but we belong to the larger environment. And that's why I think it's really important and interesting that in the biblical traditions, our home is entirety of the creation, <laughs> right? So that also poses the question, how do we think then of our narrower homes in this larger home of creation? And that's a really important thing to do because our loves are and our affections, our attachments are, because we are limited human beings, they are relatively limited. They have, a, they have limited sphere and they, they're kind of concentric circles. Uh, and I'm not uh, in favor of some kind of abstract cosmopolitanism. I wouldn't be able to love my every child like I love my, I have a four-year-old daughter, uh, and I wouldn't be able to love every child like I love my four-year-old daughter. And the way I love her, she needs to be loved to be able to grow into a person who she is to become. And that's a testimony to our um, relatively limited spatial nature, right? We have relatively limited circles in which we move and which, in, which we can be, in which life for us can, can thrive. But at the same time, we are situated in this larger network. So it's a dynamic relationship between these two. Well, I think that for, for us as church, that's often what we wrestle with is churches, we've built these incredibly beautiful sanctuaries and we, they become this safe haven to find God and to be with God and to pray. And, and yet if we spend all our time in the sanctuary and we forget to continue to go out over our threshold into the community, 
and to serve the community and understand the community in which we're calling people in, we lose that relationship. And I think for a lot of churches in this day and age, it's something that we wrestle with is, yeah. is how much of us is here and how much are we called to be out there and, and how do we navigate where our money and our time go when we understand our call as Christians to have, as you're, you're, you're describing today, that, that bigger understanding of home beyond like this sanctuary or this campus. Yeah, that's a very, very interesting, very important comment. Um, fancy word that I sometimes use to describe this relationship between the church and the, the rest of the, the world in, in terms of home, I think of the church as a meta-home. So in a sense, it's a, it's a home, uh, certain sense of belonging, certain sense of um, uh, nurturing uh, relationships to God, to, uh, to, other, uh, to other people, uh, communities being, being built. But it's not itself its own purpose. It's there actually to serve some, something else. And so we learn some of the skills and some of the commitments of necessary to build homes that are actual uh, homes in which we live, right? And I think home for me is very interesting because, and you can see that especially with a newborn child is, when you have a newborn child and, and is brought in, in home, everything that a person in sense needs is found in the home, economically, socially, personally, uh, physically, and so forth. It, it's got to be there, right? Otherwise, um, a little baby cannot grow and uh, cannot, cannot develop, right? So my sense then is our Christian calling is this sense of life in all its spheres, and the church functions in order to prepare us to help us nurture certain kinds of virtues, uh, to set the goals with which we should uh, pursue, to teach us practices of how to be the kind of people who can truly live and embody the homes uh, as, we, as we live them. Yes, Jean, come on up. Um, well, if, if you'd rather, if you'll... Yeah, well, stand up and then I'll repeat it so that everyone can... So, so there's a, there's a novel um, with a sentence of a secret dread of returning home is the phrase yeah. that we're, is a, a striking phrase to reflect upon. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I, I, there are many different ways. Uh, obviously, this is one sentence, and it can go different ways, and so we can just play each one of us uh, with, this, with this one sentence. But I think it's a very important uh, sentence. Uh, and, and the reason... But the reason why, why this kind of sentence is, is important is because um, homes can get profoundly distorted. And some of the worst distortions of our lives happen, happen in homes. I remember when I was writing uh, quite a bit about war in former Yugoslavia and, and so forth, uh, and then people uh, were talking about how kind of world politics can be really, really nasty business. We see it today in Ukraine in, in, in incredibly painful ways. But I was reflecting about this and I was toying with the idea and mentioned a number of times, I'm not sure strictly whether that's the case because I, I've never, never seen studies that, but I bet more violence happens in homes than on the battlefields more twisting of character happens at home than uh, in any other domain in which we can, uh, we, we can imagine over the lifetime of, of a person. And so home has this ambivalence for us. Um, and just because there's so much potential for good at home, therefore there is potential also for ill 
at home. The proximity is so close. Our lives are so intertwined so that um, months of tiny neglects and, uh, and, and uh, um, despising looks can wreck, uh, wreck a life. Right? And so I was talking about books. Uh, <laughs> I was, on, uh, I was on a retreat this past week, and two books that I, the novels that I brought with me to read um, uh, were by Toni Morrison and her first two, The Bluest Eye and Sula. And some of you, I don't know if you've read The Bluest Eye, it's about this little girl, who, black girl, who wants to have the, the blue eyes, right? Um, um, and, and, a, and a kind of, almost like, the, the, the craziness of, of the idea of the world in which somebody would wish something uh, of, of the sort. But, but it starts with, the, with, with Frida and, uh, well, what's the name of the, uh, of the younger daughter who, who actually, in whose voice the book is written, I'm, uh, I'm forgetting uh, right now. But they are, they are, they have seeds and they want to plant them in their yard, the marigolds. And marigolds are not growing, no matter how much they, they, they work on this. And so they wondered, we put the seed too, too deep down. What, what happened? What's wrong with the seeds? Maybe we, can, we have to... And, and, um, and then Tony Morrison said, it never occurred to us that the earth was such that is inhospitable for marigolds. <laughs> you could, they, could never, they could never grow. And in a sense, the whole novel is how life was environment, home, uh, in that way for this Pecola girl um, who wanted blue, uh, the bluest eyes uh, to have, was such that no matter what she did, it, it, it just would not, marigold would not grow. Pecola could not become a healthy, uh, healthy human, human being, which, uh, which is a reminder then that these environments of home uh, are so incredibly important for the formation of our, of our lives uh, and both dangerous and extraordinary beautiful places at the same time. Yes. I need more authority, so I'm going to <laughs> just water. I'm, excuse me. Oh, I thought you wanted to be taller than me. Yeah, no, no I, I, superiority is really important to me. <laughs> well, I, I guess that kind of speaks to my question. Um, you said that wealth and power have corrupted God's purpose, and I understand that. But I also thought you said that we need wealth and power. Yeah. Do you think that wealth and power can ever be moral in that sense that it doesn't disrupt God's purpose? I, I think the uh, uh, answer is yes. Okay. I, I, I hope it's, it's yes, <laughs> right? In a strong sense, hope because without some kind of wealth, some kind of power. We can, I've got to have some power to hold this cup, right? I've got to have some kind of wealth in order to be able to be dressed in whatever way. But wealth and power are as basic to us as anything that we, that, that we have uh, or anything that we, that we are. Um, but the question then becomes, under what conditions can there be properly had and rightly handled? And to me, that's one of the, one of the really, truly great questions. Um, and I, I think uh, the, the question of superiority, to me, is, has become increasingly important one, precisely in relation, not just in, in relation to to power and to into wealth, uh, in relation to academic achievement, for instance, to speak about something that's very close to where I sit, and it's no less of an issue there uh, 
uh, or religious superiority and so forth. So I often think that I, I, I once, once gave a lecture uh, titled, what's the worth, what's the value of being better than someone else? And answer to my question, and, and I said, well, there's monetary value to that, but what's the human value of being better than someone else? Monetary value can be, can be great, right? If you are, if you are a soccer player, right? And you, if you're better than somebody else, contracts gonna be come, come your way. I mean, you can be, you, you can be uh, you know, the, the humongous star and it can be a difference between uh, millions and millions uh, versus uh, nothing, right? Um, musicians or whatever that might be. But what, what is the human value of being better than somebody else? And my response was zero. There's value in being excellent, but there's no value in being better than, more excellent than somebody else. I gain nothing by being, as a human being, by being superior to someone. I'm tempted to then think that I'm superior, to look down on, uh, upon the person, and when I do that, I suddenly uh, think, well, I'm starting to be a lousy person just because I am better as whatever that is, which is what happens, happened to me just recently. I was, I was walking, I was in Chicago, and going to Chicago airport, and you know, you, you go under, under those big, uh, uh, go, go, uh, those, what are they? tunnels that, that you go, and, and then you have a stairs to climb up, right? It's a 53 stairs, is you climb from the, I counted them. And, and I counted them, right? Because I didn't go escalator. I always go, no matter what I do, I, I walk and I carry my luggage and I, I climb up. I climb up that stupid sta those stupid stairs and I see people going on escalators and I think I'm better because I'm walking in there. And then I think to myself, you are a total idiot. You can't, this, this just, it seems like, a, like, like such, a, such a, I don't know, making comparison of this sort seems below the dignity of a human being, right? And we make them all of the time. Silly and stupid, embarrassing, and always dumb. So I insist on my claim <laughs> that the human value of being better than somebody else is zero. <laughs> um, now, human value of the, 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 what you're organizing your life around superiority does to you is, uh, I briefly mentioned that in my, in my talk. Basically, everything that you look through and assess via its relative value to where you find yourself or where somebody else finds itself. So nothing matters to you truly as itself. It matters because it gives you certain standing, uh, index of standing of somebody else, and it ends up functioning as an indicator of relatively, relative status of people, rather than being beautiful because it is just beautiful, or meaningful to you because it's meaningful, doesn't matter what other people think about it and how it relates to them and what, is to, what does that do in terms of standing of us. And often wealth functions in this way, power functions in this way. We want it because we want to have more of it, and power then ends up being completely distorted and becomes inimical to life. I see that there's a relationship to what you just said and the idea that God is everywhere and we are everywhere but here. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Any other comments or questions? Tim, come on up. Uh, 
Um, my question is, um, I am a, a person who likes to read a lot, um, and very often what I read is historical. And I'm also a person who likes to think about solutions to problems, uh, one of which, of course, you've been talking about, uh, homelessness, but other things like uh, people who are imprisoned and don't see, have, don't have any way forward. And sometimes I liken what I do to my old hitchhiking days when I would be looking for a particular destination, having come already 50 or 100 miles on, uh, on my, my two feet, and somebody comes along and offers me a ride. And I say, well, where are you going? And, uh, and he says where he's going, and I say, oh, that's great, I'm going there as well. <laughs> but the problem with some of trying to solve problems is that if you look back, if I were to, to ask the driver of the car where he'd come from um, and spend all of my time discussing that with, with him as we journeyed forward, um, that might be a non-purposeful non conversation. And I'm involved in various groups, and um, we talk via Zoom and everything, and we look at what people have done over the past 400 or 500 years. And I absolutely agree that it's important to understand what has happened, uh, because that teaches us what we can avoid doing in the future. But. I try not to be too judgmental about those things, because if I'm judgmental, then I'm, I'm deceiving myself, really. What I read this morning, and this is the point of what I'm trying to make, is that in one of the Psalms, the longest Psalms, um, there is the, the phrase, make thy servant to delight in that which is good. And so I hear about people who are talking about, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, a sacred place, or their thoughts that are bent on, on purposes. And I'm just wondering how it would be, what you would recommend in trying to bring both of these things together. We can look, we can endlessly look back at people, what people did in the past but they were in a completely different situation to what we're in right now. We have health, good health, we have the opportunity of feeding everybody, and they didn't have that at that time. And so I don't, I want to try and curb my reading, but not necessarily lose sight of the facts. Yeah, not, not losing the sight of facts. <laughs> I think that's really important. Uh, I mean, the different ways in which, uh, which uh, one can parse out your, your question. Uh, and in some ways, it, it is a question of uh, the relationship between, uh, be, between purposes of our lives and what the facts are or what the sciences tell us that the facts uh, facts are. Yeah. Um, and if my early comments were understood as being kind of anti-science, I want to um, make sure that that would be a, a, a that I certainly would not uh, would not stand by it because I, I believe that, that we absolutely need in terms of uh, both understanding our past, historical kinds of facts, but also knowing how the world actually functions, the kind of explanation of the character of the world, because if we know how the world functions, then we can know how we can get from point uh, A to point B 
uh, presumably in a better way, than if we don't know how the world uh, functions, right? And that's why science and technology go, go hand in hand. But at the same time, I want to say, uh, that, that's fine if you know the point B. But what should our point B be? <laughs> That is, a, that is a question which we need, to, we need to ask. It's not clear to me, for instance, that we as a nation, that we as a, as a, as a uh, humanity, that we individually think sufficiently about goals of human beings. We, for instance, uh, l let, let me give you an example of which I, was, I had this small, tiny small part in it. Um, after the, the collapse, financial collapse in 2008, uh, World Economic Forum gathered Klaus Schwab, who runs World Economic Forum, gathered scholars from all over the all over the world. Uh, there were uh, 60 uh, subgroups, and at one point I was I was in one that deals with values, and at one point for one year we were meeting in Dubai regular, and one one year um, he wanted us to work or we were all to work on global redesign project, right? Global institutions and, and uh, needed to be redesigned because collapse has uh, occurred. So I sit there and I ask, okay, so normally when you design things, you ask the question, what are you, what is this thing for? Because only if I know what the thing is for, am I going to be able to design it in a, or even improve the design, right? And this was a question that was completely off the table. Nobody wanted to know what are we designing this for, or nobody, or everybody assumed that we knew what we are designing this thing for, and I take it that we were designing it so that sand would not get into the wheels of the processes and that they would function smoothly. But the goals were not set at all. And all the way from our global institutions to our lives, we hardly ever think about purposes. And to me, that's a, that's a, I'll say one more thing. We become then expert in means and amateurs in ends. And that's where I'm uh, kind of pushing against. Not for us not to be expert in means, but for us to have clarity uh, about goals that we are pursuing. So that what I hear you saying is that when we are in the sanctuary, the goals that we consider should be realistic ones and not, um, not above our ability and, and do, uh, allow our reading to, to go, to be done in, in that sort of sense of, contemplation. So, but, but, but even, even then, I want, I want the answer to question for myself, I'll, I'll talk in first person uh, singular, I want for myself an answer to the question, what's my purpose yes. in this life? Right. Right. How will I fulfill that purpose without betraying my humanity? What's the purpose of my, how, how, how do I understand the goals of me as a human being? not a goal in any individual endeavor. Right. And that seems to me that Christian faith is about. Thank you very much. Also. Thank you. Well, on that note, we're going to conclude our conversation. So a big thank you for that. And I'd like to invite you all, we do have a reception in the parish hall following, and, and it, when you go into the space, I invite you to look up around the room and see all the shields of the virtues, which will be hovering above us while we chat. So at this time, we'll go ahead and break, and if you're joining us for the reception, we'll go out this exit door here and down the hallway to the parish hall. We'd love to see you over there for some more conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today. And please know that this is on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page, so you are welcome to share this with anyone who couldn't make it today and, and let them know what you experienced. Thanks again. <laughs>